Have you seen any of the uh, uh, the Floyd trial? Real quick, sorry guys, who should I send host back to? Send it back to me. Carol has co-host rights as well, but I don't have anything and I'll certainly need those when I'm opening it up. All right, there you go. Thank you. We are live on YouTube right now. UGTV will be starting in just about 30 seconds. We're live on UGTV. Are we live? We are. Thank you so much. Sorry for being delayed. Um, I want to welcome everyone <clears throat> to this special session of the Unified Government. Um, I ask that the clerk would please call roll. Sorry, Mayor. You're hereby notified that I have called a special session of the Unified Government of Wyandotte County. Kansas City, Kansas to be held on April 15th, 2021 at 5 p.m. regarding the Police Chief Assessment Center and the introduction of KCK Police Chief candidates. 
Roll call. Philbrook. Here. Bynum. Here. Burroughs. Burroughs. Here. Townsend. Here. McKiernan. Ramirez. Here. Johnson. Here. Kane. Here. Markley. Here. Walters. Here. Alvey. Here. Thank you, Mr. Dykler. So mm -hmm. this evening we have a very sp a special session because we will be introduced to the four finalist candidates for police chief. Um, just the some idea uh, how this will proceed. Uh, I'll be turning it over to <clears throat> Mr. Bach, County Administrator here momentarily. Um, but in general, what we'll be doing is uh, commission has submitted questions. Uh, we have about 27 minutes, uh, give or take, for each candidate. Uh, we have seven questions. I wanted to make sure that uh, of the commissioners who submitted questions that each commissioner submitted questions would have an opportunity to ask one of their questions. Um, and uh, there'll be, we'll start with an introduction from each of the candidates, and then we will uh, have each commissioner ask their question uh, in sequence. And we'll do that, repeat that for all four candidates. Uh, we will have an opportunity at the very end of the questions for each candidate to give us uh, some summary comments. Uh, and we'll take a three minute break between uh, each candidate. And then after the second candidate, we'll take an additional five minutes, so eight minutes total, so that we can, uh, if we use the restroom or anything like that, just a little bit of extra time. So uh, having said that, I would now pass this over to Mr. Bach. Thank you, Mayor, Commission, members of the public, Doug Bach, County Administrator for the Unified Government. Uh, Mayor did ask that I just speak briefly about the assessment center process that we've been doing so far this week, if there are members of the public um, interested in how we're doing it. Um, as you're aware, over the last year, we've been moving through a process to, to get to the point where we are today. Um, at the end of last year, I hired a search firm that helped us go out and work to attract candidates to come in. We received those applications, narrowed the list down, and then started a series of video interviews um, over the over a Zoom system interview process. We had a listing of questions, written assignments that candidates went through as we narrowed it down to the list that we're at today, where we're at the, uh, the final four, so to speak. Um, that are here and ready to go through the process with us. Uh, this week, they started in the assessment center yesterday at noon. They had the opportunity to be interviewed by a, a neighborhood group leaders that had come forth. Um, they've been interviewed by FOP4, as well as some police, fire and sheriff commanders. Um, and we put them through some, a series of exercises. Uh, today, they've been through exercises where they were set up for how they would react to tense media situations, uh, round table, table settings where they would be in a mock scenario with other department heads. Um, they did presentation that they had prepared in advance. And they also had the opportunity to meet with some of our local youth and engage with them and answer questions that they had. Um, during that process, I had a blue ribbon committee of community members that watched see how they reacted and are able to provide me feedback from their performance and how they're how they engage through that whole process um, and this leads us up to where we are now where they get the opportunity to engage with all of you so as we lead to that process i'm going to ask misty brown our chief counsel to just offer a couple of uh, comments regarding the process that we're doing and and then she'll turn it back to the mayor misty uh, thank you, Doug. As Doug said, this is Misty Brown, Chief Counsel for the Unified Government. So this is an exciting special meet, special meeting to interview the chief candidates. And there were some questions um, just about how it would go tonight. So I think the mayor's identified that each candidate is going to be asked the, se the same seven questions that were posed by the commission. Um, because the commission is meeting as an advisory board to interview the candidates, but is not actually making the hiring decision, but is advising our county administrator, 
you know, we're going to be consistent with the questions, but if time permits at the end and they get through quickly, the mayor could take the opportunity to ask some additional follow-up questions for the candidates that were posed by the commission. And it's permissible if some candidates use up all their time with the first seven and don't get to the follow-ups. And this is basically because this is an advisory role the commission's playing tonight. And so with that, I will turn it over to the mayor. Thank you, Mr. Brown. <clears throat> and so our first uh, candidate uh, is Mr. Vince Davenport. And uh, Mr. Davenport, we're, we would ask that uh, because we do have limited time that you would uh, try to answer questions in three to four minutes. And some questions may take a little bit longer and maybe others a little bit shorter. But again, if there is a little bit time at the end, uh, I may be able to then get into some additional questions that have been posed by the commission. Um, but if you would, please just take a few minutes to tell us about yourself. And then the first question uh, will be posed by Commissioner Kane. Thank you. Uh very much, uh, Mr. Mayor and commissioners for taking time. This is really such an honor to be here, to be part of this final group in the chief selection process. And I just really wanna say thank you to uh, County Administrator Bach and his entire team for the courtesies that, they, that they've extended to us as the finalists here and for having confidence in us to uh, continue in this process. So uh, my name is Vince Davenport. I'm from Kansas City, Kansas. My wife and I, my wife Nong and I, we've raised four daughters here and We've since, uh, you know, they're grown and gone, and we've since moved on to grandkids and grand dogs. Um, I spent 25 years with the Kansas City, Kansas Police Department. I had the uh, real privilege of serving in various positions of responsibility throughout the department, uh, but probably one of the most important positions that I served in was commander of the community policing unit. That was one of the most informative positions because it really, uh, it really hits home and addresses the reason that we're all here today. And that's because the community and the police have to work together to achieve public safety. Um, after my 25 year uh, service with KCKPD, I then moved on uh, to the Department of Justice in Washington, DC. And I currently serve with the Bureau of Justice Assistance. I'm Associate Deputy Director. I oversee the Law Enforcement Division we have a portfolio of about a billion dollars where we support state and local and tribal law enforcement agencies. And what we promote uh, and what we're interested in are really uh, policing innovations. Much of my time with the Department of Justice has been spent on developing and testing community policing practices. And we fund hundreds and probably maybe a thousand over the last six years, various community policing projects across the country and what we look for is what works and what doesn't work. And the things that don't work, we shelve those. The things that we do work, we put more resources in. And we continue to fine tune that process with various iterations until we can really come up with some of the best practices and hopefully some of the next practices to uh, share with American uh, police departments across the country to help improve police community relations. And so again, it's a real honor to be here and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Commissioner Kane. Thank you, Mayor. This is pretty simple. And, as you, and there, there, no one would be surprised by my question. Have you worked with your Commissioner Kane, we're losing your audio. It's a little. That's, okay. better. That's better. Okay. Have you worked with the unions in the past and how did you get along? Commissioner Kane, I've worked very closely. But first off, I consider myself a lifelong FOP union member, which I was when I was uh, uh, a rank and file officer here and a detective with the Kansas City, Kansas Police Department. And um, I also had the opportunity as a commander later in my career to work collaboratively with the Fraternal Order of Police, Lodge Number 4, which is really one of the most respected lodges in the country. And I can say that because in my current position with the Department of Justice, I actually work very closely with the national FOP uh, and, and other major unions throughout the country, including the National Association of Police uh, Organizations. But with the national FOP currently in Washington, we're actually collaborating together with the executive leadership team for FOP to build out core curriculum for officers in response to the events of last year, including de-escalation, how do we defuse difficult uh, situations, 
And also, how do we keep officers safe and keep them healthy through officer safety and wellness uh, projects? And so I've had a very long history of working with the unions, uh, especially here in KCK. That's really where I've spent, as I've mentioned, 25 years on both sides of the table. And I will tell you that my experience is that um, in almost every case, except for, you know, from time to time, there'll be some frictions, which is understandable in labor management relations. But I would say that really in almost every situation, I think everybody that's been at the table, regardless of which side that we've been on here with, in KCK has operated in good faith. And it's all been designed to support the men and women here on the police department. And also to make sure that the uh, citizens of Kansas City really have qualified and competent police officers to uh, to serve them. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Commissioner Bynum. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, uh, Mr. Davenport. I really appreciate that you are taking time to be with us tonight. My question is this. Can you share with us, commissioners, how you've been instrumental in bringing a community-oriented policing philosophy to our department? And can you share an example of a way in which utilizing a community-oriented policing philosophy was critical in solving an issue in our community? Sure, thank you, uh, Commissioner. So here's what I will say about that. First off, I think it's important to state at the outset that the only way to achieve public safety and really the only way that crime is solved, it's, is there's only one way and one way only. And that's when the police and the community work together. And what, what I mean by that is when victims come forward, when witnesses come forward, and even when suspects cooperate. And without that, without that environment um, that permits that, you really cannot control crime effectively. And you certainly won't have public safety in the way that I think we all want it here in Kansas City, Kansas. So I'll give you a couple of examples of how I have utilized community policing principles uh, in my career here with KCKPD. One example is when I was the director of the Police Training Academy. I was a, the director there for five years. And one of the biggest challenges that we faced at the time was really recruiting for diversity. Because of deep historical issues of mistrust uh, between law enforcement and communities of color. It's very difficult. It was very challenging then, and it's even more challenging now to recruit candidates uh, that are representative of the community. And, and ideally, that's what we want our police department to look like. It's important that the department personnel from bottom to top uh, reflect the community in every way that we can. This was a subject of immense interest to me, and it was so important to me as a director of the academy that uh, during that same time period, I was working on my master's degree at the University of Kansas. And I actually wrote about the imperative of diversity within law enforcement. And I actually felt I characterized it this way in my thesis. I characterized the lack of representative diversity within law enforcement as the epicenter of race relations in the United States because it had the capacity to generate immense shockwaves. And I think that we've all seen, not only from the events of last year, but I think the events that continue to occur and prior to last year, that, that that's true. And when communities don't, when departments don't reflect the community, they're susceptible to these types of shockwaves that just, uh, just reverberate and have various second and third order consequences. So as a result of that, I rearranged our recruiting strategy. I brought in the uh, Black Police Officers Association, the Latino Peace Officers Association, and I invited them to be full partners in all of our recruiting from that day forward. And every step of the way, they assisted in that process. The second example I will give you is that, and this was years, many years ago when I was a commander, um, I really felt that it was important for various reasons to attack the issue of courtesy. And what I mean by that is that, um, is that around the country and with this department, um, there are some officers who simply don't extend the level of courtesy that they should to our residents. And that has disastrous consequences and has to be addressed. 
Um, and so one of the things that I started here, if you see on the side of every police car here, you'll see the, the phrase safety first, courtesy always. That was my uh, that was my idea. And what I did was I set out to create a survey mechanism so that whenever an officer had contact with a citizen, regardless of what that contact was, they would be provided with a contact sheet that had a link to a website so that they could rate the officer's service. And so that was kind of the external way that we could keep track of how our citizens were perceiving the actions of the officers. Because one bad experience will be remembered for a lifetime and will be shared throughout that person's uh, friends and family. And internally, what I did was I challenged every officer in our department to think of a way, regardless of what the nature of the contact is, if it's a traffic stop, if it's a disturbance call, or if you're arresting a violent felon, figure out a way at the end of that encounter to help shape that person's memory of that encounter in the light most favorable to KCKPD. And what I mean is that give them a smile, tell them thank you, say something, uh, give them a compliment, uh, say something nice about their family if they've got young kids in the car. But in any event, it's critical that we convey those types of, extend those courtesies uh, to every citizen whenever we can to ensure that we're constantly promoting the type of trust uh, that is required for communities and police to work together. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Markley. Thank you. Mr. Davenport, you, you may have answered some of this, so feel free to refer back to um, examples you've provided, but give examples of how you've worked to foster integrity among employees. So I think the, so throughout my career, I've fostered, I've attempted to foster integrity uh, in every way that I can. And I think that, um, and I, and I don't think that I'm certainly not the only one, but I think most of us who were in leadership positions over the last two decades here in KCK, I think we took that responsibility very seriously. And that was during a time when policing, what I kind of frame as the, the professionalization of policing, the, the modern professionalization of policing that was occurring over the last two decades. And um, the best example that I can give you is at the Police Training Academy. So at the Police Training Academy, I had a saying that I made sure that every recruit could remember and could recite. And it's that the strongest and the most wealthy has no greater claim to dignity than the poorest or the weakest. And this was really a reference to the fact that we're not warriors. We're guardians here to serve our population. And the truth is, is that we often find people on these calls that we respond to at some of the lowest moments uh, really in their lives. And sometimes the only thing that they have really left in their mind is their dignity. And so I insisted that every officer recognize that dignity uh, and we held officers accountable so that if there were cases where officers deviated from uh, those instructions, we were sure that they got counseled and that uh, they got back on the right track. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Townsend. How about Commissioner Philbrook? <laughs> that is correct, Commissioner Philbrook. My mistake. Sorry about that. That's okay, uh, Mayor. I'll, I'll talk to you later. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, so, sir, thank you for being here, Mr. Davenport. Thank you for taking all the time to to deal with the politicians as well as the other, <laughs> the rest of the community. Um, so you've kind of answered my question, but I'm going to get down at the weeds a little bit lower and say, how important is CIT training uh, slash trauma-informed uh, care training for officers and the whole police department? Thank you, Commissioner. That's that's really such an important question. And for those in the audience uh, that may not know, CIT is crisis intervention training. And this training, the KCK PD actually has been uh, really ahead of many departments across the country has been offering this training for many years. And it provides officers with strategies for dealing with, for first off, for recognizing when people are suffering from some form of mental crisis. And it provides strategies, strategies to ensure um, uh, that to the extent possible, we can keep situations from escalating to the point where, uh, th where bad things can happen. 
And so what I'll tell you about this topic is uh, it's such an important topic because when we think about public safety, we really can't think about it in kind of this linear old fashioned way where we just think about crime enforcement. Generally, people violate the law. The truth is, is that public safety and, and, and the crime issues that we face today, these are really in many cases, public health issues where you have persons who uh, have substance use disorder or persons in mental crisis experiencing homelessness, people with various behavioral health uh, issues that they're working through, uh, who unfortunately oftentimes, you know, have the police injected into the situation simply because people don't know where to turn. And I, I think that it's critical that police departments and communities work together with our public health officials to ensure that we do have alternative means of handling certain calls wherever possible so that we can minimize uh, risk and harm to not only the individuals, but to officers. And, and I'm just, I wanna be clear when I talk about some of these situations that by the time a 911 call happens and somebody's in crisis, to be realistic, some of these can be really dangerous calls. And some of these really honestly do require law enforcement to be there. There's some of our really need that for sure to, to protect the safety and well being of others. But that's not where I think we really need to invest our resources. I think we need to, as a community, we need to invest our resources in preventing that 911 call from happening. We need to make sure that we have not only the stabilization uh, resources that we're very fortunate to have here with RSI on Wyandotte County. And I will tell you across the country, not many jurisdictions have the, the 24 seven crisis stabilization resources that we have here, which are really vital. But I think we also need to make sure that in addition to the CIT training and in addition to continuing to strengthen the knowledge and the skills that our officers have, we do need to work collaboratively with public health officials and other stakeholders in the community to ensure that we are proactively providing persons who need those types of services, the services that they need so that they don't end up needing a 911 call. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Commissioner Townsend. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, good evening, Mr. Davenport. Thank you for your interest in serving as Chief of Police for our Kansas City, Kansas Police Department. Here is my question. Many segments of the minority community in Kansas City, Kansas have expressed a growing distrust with the police over the last several years, particularly as a result of several high profile cases for which it appeared minorities suffered unjustly while members of the police department appeared to experience no repercussion for their perceived criminal misdeeds. As chief of police, what steps would you take to build trust between those segments of the community who feel they have been treated unfairly by the police department? Thank you, Commissioner. That's that's. That's really such an important question, not only for Kansas City, Kansas, but really for our nation right now. I, I would tell you that um, I, I consider myself middle aged, but yet in my lifetime, we had a sitting governor of a state who proclaimed segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. And in my lifetime, we had police officers doing their job, arresting uh, African Americans, people of color, for doing things that we just, they're so basic, we just, the beyond uh, things that we take for granted, such as eating at restaurants, checking into hotels, or, or attempting to vote. And unfortunately, those types of structural and pervasive indignities continue to cast a, a long shadow on our nation. And we, we continue to deal with that. Law, our, our nation has evolved, and we, our nation continues to evolve, and our, as law enforcement, as an institution, we continue to evolve. And this is what we're, I think, I think this explains a lot of what we're dealing with today. And I think it's very important that we recognize this history. And I think to, uh, there, are, there are some who are quick to either dismiss the history or some that really don't fully understand the history. And I think that we have a duty to make sure, especially with younger officers, that they do know that, that there is context here and it does matter. With regard to accountability, I will tell you that 
uh, you know, the, the simplest thing I have to tell you with regard to holding officers accountable for misconduct, uh, I want to, is that collectively as a community, not just the police department, we have to have a zero uh, tolerance policy for that. We, we will not allow officers to engage in misconduct without swift and certain consequences. And, and I'm not talking about mistakes. I mean, we, we all make mistakes. I've made plenty in my lifetime, but I'm talking about acts of misconduct. Uh, we have to be clear about that. And one of the ways I think that we help to rebuild that trust, and first, before I say rebuild, I want to be clear about one thing. Kansas City, Kansas, despite some of the strain and some of the uncertainty and some of the angst that we're all experiencing now nationwide and in our community, especially in communities that are very diverse like Kansas City, Kansas, it's still a great community. There's still so much connectedness, I think, not only between the police department and communities across the city and neighborhoods across the city. I want to be, I, I want to make sure that everybody watching this understands what a great community, community this is and that we do have that connectedness. However, we have a lot of work to do ahead of us. We need to ensure that everybody, when we're talking about developing policies and we're talking about developing procedures on how we're going to reduce crime in our city, Everybody has to be at the table. And one of the things that I would do as chief is I would establish the chief's committee on safety and inclusion. And the purpose of that committee would be twofold. Number one, it's to ensure that we're identifying gaps. Who's not at the table? And when I say at the table, I mean literally at the table, developing policy, developing a strategy. One thing that's been made crystal clear this past year and that Americans all across this country are demanding is they're demanding a voice. They're demanding a right to say how they want to be policed. Um, and our challenge as leaders in this field is to honor that the way that it deserves to be honored. And so, um, you know, there's nothing secret about what we do here. This isn't the CIA or NSA. It's not that we have secrets. When we develop policies, we need to have community members from all walks of life. Uh, including young people, high school students at the table with us, helping us to craft crime reduction policies and strategies. And if there's, and helping us, we have an annual review policy or an annual review of policies here in the PD. We need to have citizens uh, as a part of that review. And I, I can imagine maybe a one or two year term where people would serve on this committee and we would rotate new people in so that more people had an opportunity to participate. But the idea that we can operate in a black box, so to speak, and just develop the policies that we want to develop, um, those, those days are gone. And to the extent that anybody believes that you can develop policies and strategies without full input and full ownership from the people who uh, are, that live in this community, um, that just won't fly. So I'm very excited at the prospects of, of, of establishing that committee and really making KCKPD a model for other cities in terms of transparency and accountability. Thank you, Commissioner thank you. Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and welcome, uh, Mr. Davenport. Uh, to a degree, you've already addressed uh, the question that I have. Maybe you can go into it a little bit more. Um, but as you are well aware, uh, Wyandotte County is a community of great diversity. Uh, very rich in diversity um, and cultural competency is a necessary strength that, um, that the, our next chief of police must exhibit. So with that, what strategies, both short-term and long-term, uh, would you use to increase diversity uh, within the police force in terms of both recruitment and promotion? And please detail what strategies you've already implemented or witnessed uh, that were successful. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, so to the to the point that KCK is is a very diverse community, there's no question about that. And I will just tell you that um, I think many of us uh, come from backgrounds that uh, really have been rich in diversity. And so my wife uh, is when she and I met, she was a Laotian refugee, and so we too share uh, kind of a diverse cultural background, a blended. Uh, cultural background in our home. So this is something that I very much treasure and I very much appreciate about the diversity that we do have here in Kansas City, Kansas. 
And so to answer your question about how do we build diversity back into this department, how do we strengthen it? Um, I think first off, we have to just, we have to name it. We have to make sure that the policy is clear and that people know what it is that we're trying to do. We have to have, um, we have to have, as I mentioned before, we have to ensure that we have advocates at the table who represent, who come from and who represent and who can describe some of the concerns um, of the various diverse communities here in KCK. I think we need to, uh, I think a very important piece of that is involving young people and helping to craft a message. It's very difficult to attract law enforcement officers today, regardless of race or ethnicity, um, especially given the events of this last year. And so I think that we really need to kind of start with a clean slate, bring everybody to the table and actually craft a written strategic plan on how we want to do, how we want to recruit. And we have people at the table, we bring young people to help us craft the message, messages that resonate. And I think it's also fair to say that to a certain extent, the chief of police has a, a bully pulpit of sorts. And I think the chief has to use that. And I think the chief has to put out a, a call to serve countywide. So whether you work at Amazon, whether you Mr. work- Mr. Davenport, you have two minutes remaining. Thank you. Whether you work at Amazon, whether you work at Certainty, uh, or wherever, I think we should challenge people to consider changing careers. If there was ever a time that we needed good people in law enforcement, it's today. Um, and I think we also need to engage, continue to engage with our partners, with the Black Police Officers Association, with the Latino Peace Officers Association. And again, these are organizations that I brought together, brought to the table when I was the director of police training to enhance diversity in KCK. And the last piece that I'll leave, leave you with is that, and this is not KCK specific, but I do currently work with the National Association of Black Law Enforcement Executives with their executive team very closely on developing recruiting strategies that they are implementing across the country. So I think in addition to the local partners, I think we can also leverage national partners as well, uh, all again, to make KCK kind of a model of how things are done right. Thank you. Thank you. I know we're uh, running against time. We've set aside three extra minutes for transition, but uh, we have one last question, Commissioner Ramirez. And so I'd ask you to uh, be as brief as possible. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, Mr. Davenport, Davenport, for being here tonight. And thank you, Commissioner Johnson, for your question. It kind of leads into mine about cultural competency. I and two other commissioners are working with community members on an ordinance. Um, pertaining to um, our residents who are here. So my question to you is, what do you believe is a local law enforcement agency's role when it comes to federal immigration law enforcement activities? Sure, thank you for the question. Again, another question with, nat with great national importance. Uh, the, the simple answer is nothing. It's not our, that's not our responsibility. Uh, whether or not a person- Mr. Davenport, we're at 27 minutes. I'm gonna allow one extra minute, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would say, here's, here's our responsibility. Our responsibility is to make sure that everybody who resides within the confines of Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas, that they feel safe in contacting the police if they need the police. And uh, you know, the, the question of whether or not somebody is, has legal status or not is of absolutely no, has no bearing on whether or not we provide service. It has no bearing on the type of service that we would provide. So uh, again, the short answer to your question is it has no bearing whatsoever. Everybody deserves good police service and that's what everybody should get. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davenport. We appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So if you would like to have a couple of minutes commission, if you have any notes to jot down or um, we will begin the next one at 5.38. And that's iPhone time. And if we would go ahead and queue up the next candidate.
The next candidate is on deck, Mayor. Thank you. All right, we will begin. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Waldeck, for being here today. And uh, just so you know, we have seven questions that have been submitted by commissioners. And uh, I'm gonna go in order of having commissioners ask the questions. If there is any additional time left at the end, we'll have, have you give some uh, final comments. And then perhaps if there's extra, even more time, we'll I'll ask uh, additional questions that have been posed by the commission. But if you'd like to begin with just telling us about yourself a little bit. Hi, my name is Pamela Waldeck. I have um, been employed with the Kansas City, Kansas Police Department since 1997. I am currently the director of the Bureau of Operations, which is our largest bureau on the police department. Um, I have worked in narcotics, child abuse, and uh, internal affairs um, for the longest periods of time uh, while I've been with the Kansas City, Kansas Police Department. Uh, I was born and raised in Wyandotte County. Uh, I lived in the Bonner Edwardsville area prior to becoming a Kansas City, Kansas police officer. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And I am uh, married. My husband's also a lifelong resident of Wyandotte County. And we have one daughter uh, named Lucy. She's four. Thank you so much. We'll now begin with commissioner's questions. Commissioner Kane. Thank you, Mayor. This one should be easy for you. Have you worked with the union in the past and how did you get along? Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Yes, I have worked with the um, unions in the past and um, currently work with uh, Fraternal Order Police Lodge 4 in addition to the other unions that represent uh, civilian employees on our police department. And um, I have always uh, gotten along with the union. I served on the e-board as a union member when I was a uh, patrolman and um, among the rank and file. And I have a lot of respect for the union and uh, believe that we have to cooperate to make progress. And I make that a goal of mine to uh, listen to what they have to say and um, find a cooperative solution that is advantageous uh, and benefits the department and the citizens of Kansas City, Kansas. Thank you. Commissioner Bynum. Thank you, Mayor. Deputy Chief, it's nice to have you tonight, and I appreciate that you're here to spend some time with us. Share with us how you've been instrumental in bringing a community-oriented policing philosophy to the department, and share an example, if you can, of a way in which utilizing a community-oriented policing philosophy was critical in solving a problem in our community. Um, so I actually uh, command the community policing unit. They're uh, among the Bureau of Operations, and we strive to have community policing in all aspects of our agency. So um, we allow the officers that are in the stations that aren't in the community policing unit, we encourage them and to also engage with the community, and we understand that officer presence is a deterrent to crime. So doing community engagement and just merely being present also lowers crime. So we encourage officers to do that, business checks, area checks, uh, follow-ups with crime victims and things of that nature to instill community policing um, throughout the whole agency. Uh, recently, as everyone has been affected by COVID, uh, after all of the governor's orders um, went out of effect for regarding vehicle registration and things of that nature, we were towing cars that had 45 day expired tags. And I learned through community um, conversations and information that we were really putting a lot of our citizens in a bad way by towing their cars. And then the, the backlog of them being able to get their cars out of tow was just further victimizing them um, from being unemployed and other financial responsibilities. So based on the community input, we stopped towing cars until everybody could get caught up and um, the backup could be cleared. And now we've done a press release and we're letting people know we're going to start towing cars again on um, May 1st, but we wanted to give everyone a broad time frame to be able to get everything straight 
and uh, have awareness before we just started towing again. Thank you, Commissioner Markley. Thank you. Give examples of how you have worked to foster integrity among employees. Um, I lead by example and um, I lead with integrity. I also have set clear standards for our new hires of, of the level of integrity and um, level of professionalism among our agency. And I also put forth clear boundaries when issuing discipline regarding anything having to do with integrity issues. Um, we, uh, we have a veracity list that um, pertains to integrity issues. And um, I feel like leading by example and setting clear guidelines and boundaries. Uh, we've also added verbiage, very clear verbiage to our ethics general order that lets officers know if they see something, they must say something. Thanks. Commissioner Philbrook. Thank you for being here. Oh, yep, there's that nice smile. I thought I recognized that. Um, so my question kind of takes it down a little bit into the weeds. Okay, Pam. So here we go. It's how important is CIT training as well as trauma-informed care training for officers and the whole police department? I think it's very important. Um, we left the Memphis model years ago uh, that said that CIT officers, the only officers that should be trained are those that volunteer for CIT training. And um, we believe that the CIT training benefits everyone. And so um, I believe our numbers now are about 87% of our uh, frontline officers are CIT trained and we always strive to have 100%. Um, COVID slowed us down on offering some trainings. Uh, but I believe that CIT uh, training and trauma-informed care is um, necessary. It has to happen. And we, um, we have recently implemented training. Uh, all of our detectives went through trauma-informed interviewing last year, and we are moving forward with more trauma-informed uh, training and more CIT. And um, I would like to expand our CIT unit as well. Uh, I believe it's priceless for our community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Commissioner Townsend. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Deputy, Deputy Chief. Thank Good you evening. for your interest in, in wanting to serve as Chief of Police for KCK PD. My question is this. Many segments of the minority community in Kansas City, Kansas have expressed a growing distrust with the police over the last several years, particularly as a result of several high profile cases for which it appeared minorities suffered unjustly, while members of the police department appeared to experience no repercussions for their perceived criminal misdeeds. As chief of police, what steps would you take to build trust between those segments of the community who feel they have been treated unfairly by the police department? I think that um, we have to listen and we have to let everyone make sure everyone's voice is heard uh, so that we can clearly understand and communicate um, the issues to build relationships and to build that trust. Um, I really would like to try to implement um, foot patrols on some level so we can get officers on foot knocking on doors and having face to face conversations um, with every segment of our community so they can actually speak with an officer and see the human side of the, of the officers and the officers can take ownership in, in the neighborhoods. Um, I think that that would build relationships and foster trust as well. Um, I think that we need to continue having difficult conversations and having uh, exploring ways for both sides of the community to come together and trust the police department, uh, continuing to have education um, like the police academy, the uh, citizens academy, and working through livable neighborhoods to make sure that we're communicating and continuing to um, entertain and listen to those difficult conversations. I think that's how, how we get better. And also continuing to be very transparent in our uh, internal, when we have internal investigations and when we have issues and um, our officers, uh, we have officer misconduct just being very, very transparent about how we're handling that 
and the steps that we took to um, make sure that we are better and that we are um, operating at a level that our citizens deserve. Um, I really think that it really just boils down to us being available for the citizens and being open to having the difficult conversations and answering the questions when they come about. Thank you very much. Commissioner Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and uh, welcome uh, Deputy Chief Waldeck. Um, as you are well aware, um, Wyandotte County is um, a community that is very rich in its diversity. And with that being said, uh, cultural, cultural competency is a necessary strength uh, that our next police chief must exhibit. Um, so what strategies, both short-term and long-term, would you use to increase uh, the diversity of the police force in terms of both recruitment and promotion? And please detail what strategy, strategies you've either implemented or witnessed that were successful. Um, one thing that we started about a year ago was um, more intense recruiting and using um, officers of uh, minority officers and very uh, diverse officers to assist with recruiting. And actually we did a video that, um, we did a video directed towards um, African-American officers using our African-American officers in an effort to recruit, to try to um, speak directly to the African-American community and um, talk to them about our police officers that we currently have and trying to uh, recruit more. We've also uh, reached out to many churches and religious organizations and gone into the neighborhoods with our recruiters. I, um, and that, that had, has helped. And then of course COVID hit and slowed us down. And so now we're um, back where we started. I would like to implement a full-time recruiting staff. Uh, right now we do it on temporary assignment. And I think that we need to um, take a page, you know, page like out of the military's book on recruiting. And we need to start doing full-time recruiting. Topeka Police Department has done that and it's done very well. And so I would like to uh, have two full-time recruiting officers out of the chief's office um, to constantly have those conversations and connections and to start making relationships um, in the high schools and in the colleges that we have here locally um, and be able to have they'll have the time by being full-time recruiters to cultivate those relationships and get in the churches and get in the community centers and really um, make a difference and make an impact. And I think that that is how we give back to the community and build those relationships to, um, so that people from Kansas City, Kansas want to join our police department and, and trust us enough to invest in the, in the city as policemen. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Ramirez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, Deputy Chief Waldeck, for being with us tonight. Um, uh, you are very well aware of safe and welcoming and what I and a couple other commissioners and community members are trying to do and work together on. So my question is, what do you believe is a local law enforcement agency's role when it comes to federal immigration law enforcement activities and how will your department Re respond and interact with those with said activities? Um, so we do not have the authority to enforce anything having to do with immigration and um, we have no role in immigration. We serve the, the citizens of Kansas City, Kansas. So um, as far as uh, safe and welcoming, um, we as police officers, we enforce the laws of Kansas City, Kansas and of the state of Kansas. and um, I don't, immigration doesn't uh, play a role in the in state or municipal code. Um, so I, I, I don't, we're not going to get involved in immigration issues um, as, as far as your question goes. Um, and as far as safe and welcoming, I am aware of it. I don't know uh, the full extent of the safe and welcoming presentation just as it uh, pertains to the police department. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We have some additional time, so I'm gonna ask a, a few more questions. Uh, the first is as police chief, 
what major objectives would you want to achieve in the police department and with the community it serves? Um, the first thing we need to do is get our staffing um, to full staff. We need to, um, our police officers and uh, emergency communications are both having staffing issues right now. So I would like to um, get full-time recruiters and really concentrate on recruiting um, and uh, getting our staff back to where it is, where it needs to be. Uh, I would like to implement foot patrols. And I, uh, I think that that would be a great community engagement piece and um, also would help us reduce our crime. Uh, I think in order to actually implement foot patrols in the best way possible, according to the research that I've done, we actually need to increase our authorized strength, um, which I know is probably a little ways off budget wise, but I would like to look at um, implementing a foot patrol uh, I would also like to increase our CIT program, uh, and I think we could do that under our current authorized strength, but I think that increasing our CIT program ultimately will reduce calls for service and will um, help with some of the issues, the mental health issues that we're seeing right now coming out of COVID. Describe what you consider a healthy relationship between the chief and the police union would be particularly given the pressure nationally to evaluate policies and or contracts in a much, much broader manner to consider one, pension payouts for those few bad actors, officers involved shooting of innocent lives, particularly people of color. And secondly, coverage allowed for bad actors from other jurisdictions to find employment in Wyandotte County. Um, I think that a healthy relationship between the chief and the union is open lines of communication and, and that you're actually having these conversations about these topics that you've just listed what, before they become relevant here. Uh, so everyone knows where everybody stands on those topics. Um, as far as um, pension uh, payouts, I'm not sure I understand the question. If someone is terminated, then will the union doesn't necessarily have a role in the pension payout, a payout of a termination, um, and that's um, that goes back to the retirement system. Um, what was the second part of your question? The second part would be. Or, uh, what would you consider a healthy relationship between the chief and the police union and how it would relate to coverage that would be allowed for bad actors from other jurisdictions to find employment in Wyandotte County? So we do a thorough background check. And um, I, when we, when we do our thorough background check, that includes looking at personnel records and um, uh, employment records from the other jurisdictions. So I would hope that they would never get hired. Um, someone that came from another jurisdiction and tried to get hired here, I, I don't think we would ever hire them for that to be an issue. And we have time for one more question, which I will combine to, uh, do you, would you intend to have your leaders in the department attend and apply leadership training? And will you have regular leadership meetings? Yes, so routinely right now we have um, leadership uh, retreats twice a year, and I would uh, intend on continuing that. And we send all of our majors to uh, PERSE Senior Management Institute program uh, in Boston, and um, we would continue to do that as well. Um, that's, I think that leadership training is very important. Uh, I think that the way you treat your employees is very important and, and that's part of the leadership training. Uh, I think that uh, happy employees do a better job. And so it's very important to make sure that your employees feel valued. And, and part of that is making sure that the leadership style of management is conducive to a positive work environment. So yes, I would continue to um, have our leadership training often and make sure that everyone understands. We actually have time for one more question. Um, 
what is your position on the use of law enforcement agencies from outside the local department to investigate officer-involved shootings or accusations of police misconduct? Um, I don't have an issue with um, law enforcement officers from outside our jurisdiction um, investigating our shootings or misconduct. I think that um, we do have some uh, things in place to make sure that uh, officers, the officer involved shootings are investigated fairly um, and that everyone gets due process. And I think that that's important, but I, I don't have an issue with outside agencies investigating our officer involved shootings. Um, I think that uh, it's become a national standard. And I also think that the manner in which uh, the shootings are investigated are becoming a national standard as well, where everyone uh, does them consistently. Um, so I, I don't have an issue with that. And if we have officers that are doing misconduct and it's brought to someone else's attention before it's brought to our attention, I, I would hope that someone would investigate it. Um, we do a great job of policing ourselves. And um, I, I would look for that to continue, but others investigating us, that doesn't, if we're if we're acting in a bad manner, it needs to be addressed, regardless of who investigates it. Thank you. Do you have any closing uh, comments or remarks for us? Uh, I very much appreciate the opportunity to be here. I love the Kansas City, Kansas Police Department. I wake up every day and get to go to a job I love, and I feel very fortunate to get to do that because I know not everyone does. Um, so I appreciate this opportunity, and um, I appreciate um, all of the officers uh, out on the streets every day and the hard work they do. And, and I think that um, they deserve uh, a great leader and, and I would love to be that person. Thank you again. Right, we will now take just a five minute uh, break and we will uh, come back at 6.05. You don't need to log out, uh, just stay on, but gives us a little bit of time to take care of personal needs.
All right, it is 6.05, we will resume. Uh, our next candidate is Mr. Carl Oakman. Um, Mr. Oakman, we're going to, I'm going to uh, offer each commissioner who submitted a question, opportunity to ask a question. Um, we'd like you to begin with just giving us a, a brief uh, introduction about yourself. And uh, if there is time at the end, there will be some, uh, you'll have an opportunity to make some summary remarks. So the first, uh, if you would, just kind of give us a brief introduction to yourself. Okay, um, good evening and thank you for having me. Uh, I'm excited to be part of this uh, process. Um, as you see, my name is Carl Oakman. I was born and raised in Kansas City, Kansas, and I'm looking forward this op for this opportunity. I'm currently a deputy chief with the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department. I've been with the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department for approximately 29 years. Uh, my current role, I oversee the Patrol Bureau, which consists of all six patrol divisions, traffic division, special ops division, uh, traffic division, as well as our social services uh, unit, as well as our crime, um, our crisis intervention team and detention unit. Uh, as I said, I've been a deputy chief the last uh, four years. Thank you, sir. We'll now move on to commissioner of questions. Commissioner Kane. Thank you, mayor. And thank you for applying for this job. My question is, have you worked with the unions in the past and how did you get along? Uh, yes, I've, I, in my day-to-day -day, um, job currently in Kansas City, Missouri, I oversee the patrol bureau, which is approximately 80% of the uh, police officers. Uh, I see it, I oversee 1,025 employees. And the patrol bureau has the most incidents of discipline. So, uh, and that would be expected because it's the patrol uh, bureau. So I work with the union constantly on disciplinary issues, uh, transfer issues, assignment issues, and I have a good working relationship with, with the president. Um, we don't always agree, but we always try to come to a, a compromise that's best for, for the officers and all involved. Uh, I always work to try to collaborate and working with the union. Um, I've, I've always worked with them, even going back to, uh, I, I created a uh, wellness unit. I worked with the human resources division and I made sure that the union had appropriate representation uh, on that steering committee. And uh, with all the initiatives that I've, I've collaborated with other members of the department to implement, I've always included the union uh, as representation, as well as uh, uh, sponsoring or working with uh, those initiatives, uh, because that's very important to get everyone involved who the decisions affect. Thank you. Commissioner Bynum. Thank you, Mayor. Welcome, Deputy Chief Oakman. Appreciate you spending time here with us tonight. Can you please share with the commission how you've been instrumental in bringing a community-oriented policing philosophy to your department? And can you share an example of a way in which utilizing community-oriented policing philosophy was critical in solving an issue in your community? Thank you. Yes, um, I've worked my entire career to work with the community to address issues in, in the community. Uh, even when it comes to youth engagement, which I think is a very important um, aspect of community policing. I've uh, worked with uh, the community as well as uh, staff in Kansas City to implement several uh, youth engagement programs that helps the police and the youth build the uh, bridge the gap and uh, build trust. Uh, one is the uh, Police uh, Summer Youth Academy, which is for youth 12 to 15. Uh, we started that in 2017, and each each summer we have about 90, 90 kids throughout the city, and they build relationships with police officers, and we've seen uh, a lot of positive interaction from that, as well as the Police Explorers Program uh, that uh, that's geared towards youth. Uh, 
we've seen uh, a lot of success. And, and well, and one of the things, these programs, it's, it's very diverse and you're setting up uh, young people to go into a career in law enforcement, which is very important. Uh, when I was the division commander at South Patrol, uh, this is an a good, excellent example of community policing. Uh, we had an issue with two uh, hotels off of 435 and uh, 87th Street. Uh, the majority of South Patrol, approximately 40% of our calls for service was related to these two hotels. Uh, there was uh, prostitution, gang activity, uh, narcotics. We've also, we had violence. There was a couple homicides. So well, as the division commander, I worked with the community to bring the businesses together, the homeowners together, as well as the city uh, to deal with some issues around health. We had the health department involved, Newsom Business Task Force. And with all these entities, including the businesses and the residents, we were able to come up with expectations for the owners of the hotel. So we, we gave them a two year program where they failed to meet the expectations. So we continued and we worked diligently to try and get the hotel to be a reputable business. And unfortunately, um, they kept failing and we documented and through our efforts as jointly as a community, we were able to get both of those uh, hotels closed and demolished and now they're green space. And the significant thing is calls for service went down approximately 30% in South Patrol once we closed those two hotels, which as you know, if the calls go down 30%, we can then use those police resources in other parts of the, of the division. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Markley. Thank you. Give examples of how you have worked to foster integrity among employees. Well, I think the a big thing when it comes to uh, integrity, uh, that's, that's one of my um, goals is to continue uh, to develop a diverse professional workforce through uh, officer wellness training and career development. And integrity starts within the department uh, from the chief down to the command staff. You have to instill in your employees <clears throat> that they're valued, they're important, and <clears throat> their input matters. And that's how you start addressing integrity because if you have employees that are not happy at work, uh, especially when it comes to the police department, um, <clears throat> and you put them out in the community, you're asking for a uh, disaster. So it starts inside uh, making sure that, um, <clears throat> that all officers are valued, they're properly trained. Uh, officer, we look at officer wellness, ensure that they're well and that we create a culture of transparency. Um, something I always say, the police department is not perfect, but we, but we must be honest. And as chief, I will make sure that we have an honest police department. Thank you. Commissioner Philbrook. Yes, thank you, Mr. Oakman for being here. I should say deputy chief, sorry about that. Um, and I know you have your hands full over there. So, you know, we would uh, appreciate you taking the time to come over and see us. Uh, my question is how important is CIT um, and training and trauma-informed care training for your officers and the whole police department? Uh, it's, it's very important. Um, being trained in CIT, it includes the crisis intervention team uh, concept as well as de-escalation in addition to mental health awareness. Uh, so it is very important if we look at the current environment uh, in policing, uh, there is a lot of issues where the police is responding to people who are in crisis regarding mental health. So the police department, we have to continue to be uh, flexible and expand our training. And that's something that it can, in Kansas City, Missouri, that as the patrol bureau commander, I ensure that every member of patrol has been trained in CIT. So that's a process we're working on to make sure that every sergeant and officer are 
they're trained in the CIT. Also, in Kansas City, Missouri, we have each of the patrol divisions have a so social worker who is actually paid for and is a Kansas City, Missouri employee. And that, that program is under the patrol bureau, which I oversee. So it's been very beneficial in dealing with mental health up front, as well as being available for services after traumatic events, uh, because daily we have issues where young children, um, as well as adults are, are, are exposed to trauma. And the officers now have a mechanism where they can refer people for services through our social workers at H Patrol Division. Been a very successful program and hopefully in the future we can expand it. Thank you so much. I appreciate your Commissioner Townsend. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Def Deputy Chief Oakman. Thank yeah. you for your interest in wanting to move to what we believe is the right side of the I-70 bridge uh, to become chief of police for Kansas City, Kansas Department. My question to you is this. Many segments of the minority community in Kansas City, Kansas have expressed a growing distrust with the police over the last several years, particularly as a result of several high profile cases for which it appeared minorities suffered unjustly while members of the police department appeared to experience no repercussions for their perceived criminal misdeeds. As chief of police, what steps would you take to build trust between those segments of the community who feel they have been treated unfairly by the police department? Well, I, I think the first thing is you have to be transparent and you always have to be honest. Um, one thing I think with the, with the police department, if we make a mistake, we must, uh, you know, I always tell people, it's not against the law to apologize. If we make a mistake, uh, we need to own up to the mistake, uh, meet with the community, explain how we're moving forward from that mistake and put policies and procedures in place so that it doesn't happen in the future. Um, but the, the big thing is we, we have to have we have to be focused on relationship-centered practices uh, in the community uh, because it's very important to uh, restore. It's, it's easy to strengthen our existing relationships, but we definitely have to restore the broken ones. And as, as chief, we have to you have to be a part of the communities that you're serving as the police. And that is... Uh, make sure that the police is involved in those community events that those particular com communities are having. If they invite the police, show up, be a part of it. Um, continue to build to build trust. And you have to set, set a culture of <clears throat> transparency. And it starts from the beginning at the top with the chief. Uh, and that, that filters down to the command staff. And what I talked about earlier is that we have to make sure officers feel uh, valued, and engaged in their department. So we're putting healthy officers out on the street who understand the communities that, they're, um, that they've taken an oath to serve and protect. And I think that's the big thing to understand that as police officers, you're there to serve the community, not to police the community. And you have to, you have to, you have to serve all members of the community, not just the, not just the part of the community that is supportive of the community, of the police department. We're here for all members of the community. And as chief, that's something that I would strive to do to, to continue to change that, that culture and understanding. And, and I do have to say, there is so many officers in, in, in the profession that get that, they understand that. And you, we need to use those officers as training officers to make sure that that, that culture is trained in, to, in the new officers as they're coming on. And, and the other part to that is we, we, have, to, we have to work on strategies to increase uh, minority representation in policing. As I mentioned, as one of my goals is to have a diverse professional um, police workforce. And I think we can do that working with all entities, including the union, to make sure that we have uh, innovative and creative recruitment strategies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Commissioner Johnson. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor, and uh, welcome Deputy Chief uh, Oakman. And my goodness, you could not have provided a better segue uh, in your last answer in uh, relative to my question, which is, um, mm -hmm. as you're aware, that Wyandotte County is a community that is rich in our uh, diversity. And as, a, as, a, as such, cultural competency is a, a necessary uh, strength that our next chief of police must have. Um, what strategies, both short-term and long-term, would you use to increase the diversity uh, of the police force, both in terms of recruitment and promotion? And please detail what strategies that you have either implemented or witnessed that were successful. Okay, um, <clears throat> let me take the last part of that question first, if that's okay. Um, yeah, my, minority recruiting and recruiting in general is a very important uh, topic in policing. And, and I always like to say, I think the first criteria is we need to make sure that we're recruiting and hiring good people to start off with. Uh, that, that's the first part of that. Um, in, in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, I was over several units that in, what centered around hiring and recruiting. Uh, one thing that I did in the early uh, <clears throat> 2000s when I was an employment unit um, supervisor, I worked with the staff to create a concept called open testing. And, and basically uh, what we did is we picked a location in the city. We used uh, Penn Valley uh, Community College. We, we got the test, we put the testing out of a police facility. Um, we advertised at that time in the paper, all the different papers and um, some television and radio advertisement that we were having a test. All an individual had to do is show up with a driver's license. Now we would collect all the other necessary documents once they passed the test and was moving on in the process. But we removed the initial hurdle of people trying to locate their birth certificate, their social security card, all those things that would take time and often you can't find. So we removed that obstacle immediately. We had some of the largest participation we've ever had in our test. And the surprising thing is that year we had a <clears throat> academy class that resulted in the highest minority representation we've ever had in a class. Um, and we continued to do that uh, several years and we could see the increase in minority hiring and <clears throat> re recruiting. But I always say it's a four, it's a four step process. It has to be, we have to recruit, we have to hire, we have to train and we have to retain. So there, each, each of those areas need new and innovative strategies to make sure that we're doing that. Um, another another uh, <clears throat> strategy that I did in Kansas City, Missouri was continue to look at the processing time. Um, that, that's another big hurdle. <clears throat> when you're competing for other employees in the workforce, uh, there are people that they, they cannot wait eight to nine months to a year to get hired for a job. So we have to look at that processing and figure out how to reduce <clears throat> that processing time while maintaining all the required requirements to be a police officer. And it can be done. You just have to put the effort in and think outside the box and be innovative. So I think that's, that's a big step <clears throat> and, and continue to engage uh, the minority communities. Another initial we did, initiative we did was we went down to the <clears throat> Tennessee State and Jackson State, which are historically black colleges. All departments do that. That's nothing in, innovative or creative. But what we did was we established a relationship with the dean of the criminal justice departments in, at those universities. So what we did, we talked to each of the classes throughout the week. Uh, about policing. Uh, and we also, we talked about the historical issues around policing um, and, and had honest and open discussions before we even got to the point to where we were talking about the benefits that's offered. So, and then what we did at the end of the, end of the week, we actually gave our written tests right there on campus. And we had a large participation and it was 
quite successfully successful. And we ended up hiring, I believe we ended up hiring three to four uh, applicants out of that process to be police officers in Kansas City, Missouri. So those are, those are ways that we can do some things, but I have a eight objective plan for uh, Kansas City, Kansas. And one of an objective six of my plan is to develop innovative strategies to recruit, hire, train, and retain a diverse workforce. And I have about seven priority actions. So I do have a plan and, and it's a little more detailed, but there's, there's different things we can do to work on minority recruitment. And I think building trust is a big one, as well as getting assistance from the community. Thank you. You're welcome. Commissioner Ramirez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you, Deputy Chief Oakman, for being with us today and for taking the opportunity to um, want to come and serve and protect our community. That means a lot. Uh, my question, it pertains to, um, you know, like Commissioner Johnson said, we have a very diverse community and part of that community are our immigrants. They are, they are part of this community and they are residents. And so my question to you is, what do you believe is a local law enforcement agency's role when it comes to federal immigration law enforcement activities, and how will your department respond or interact with said activities? Well, well first off, thank you for the question. And um, I, I tell you, when it comes to uh, the, the community, uh, I believe all members are part of the community and the police is here to serve all members of the community. Um, I know in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, our response to uh, immigration has been the same in the past 40 years. There's nothing that um, politically has come about that has changed the police response uh, to immigration issues. And um, as chief, I will convey those same sentiments in, in Kansas City, Kansas. Um, the, the way it's always been is that uh, police departments do not um, actively search out uh, individuals that are not documented or um, can be considered uh, not legal citizens. Um, that's not the role of the police. The role of the police is to continue to serve and protect the community. In fact, that that taking that approach would actually uh, increase uh, community policing because we wanna make sure that our immigrant communities are not afraid to report uh, acts of violence or issues that they need police services. And as chief, I will make sure that we treat all members of the community um, of Kansas City, Kansas with dignity and respect and that everyone has the opportunity to uh, police services. You know, I always, when you look at um, policing, all members of the community, we have several different units in policing, but at the end of the day, most, most community members expect when they call 911 that a police officer show up in a uniform, in a police car, and they're courtesy, they're courteous, respectful, and they value and they the, and they're value that person and they're there to help them through their crisis or their situation. And that's the culture that I will install in the Kansas City, Kansas Police Department. And regarding um, the Hispanic community, I think we can do a lot, lot more uh, community outreach. Uh, some initiatives that I have in my plan is to uh, establish a Hispanic community liaison officer to deal with issues that come up regarding um, immigration and other issues such as U visas and uh, other issues, as well as uh, develop a Hispanic language citizens, uh, citizens Police Academy. I know KCK currently has a Citizens Police Academy, but um, I would like to develop a Spanish language uh, language Citizens Academy in addition. We've, we've tried that in Kansas City, Missouri. And so I think that that's, that's an opportunity to reach that, that segment of the population that may have some fear interacting or dealing with the police. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. So we have about two minutes left. If you would like to give us some closing remarks or make additional 
uh, statements about your program, that would be welcome. Okay, well, um, like I said, thank you very much for this opportunity. And um, I just wanted to summarize the um, <clears throat> strategic, my proposed strategic plan. Uh, due to time, I can't go into the, all the action um, uh, steps, but I can uh, give each of you the, uh, <clears throat> give you my goals and then the, uh, um, the objectives. And I can do that quick here. Uh, my goals, I have three goals, is strengthen relationships with all members of the community to re reduce crime and improve trust and recruitment. Uh, my second goal is to continue to develop a diverse professional workforce through transparency, officer wellness training, and career development. And Everybody my third, have two minutes. All right, my third is to improve efficiency through the use of technology and resource allocation. Uh, my first objective, strengthen community policing, trust, transparency, youth engagement for all members of the community. Uh, two is to implement crime reduction efforts and prevention strategies that do not erode community trust. And three is review and improve police department technology. Four, proactively install a strong culture of open communication within the police department with an emphasis on feedback and engagement by all ranks. And five, develop a detailed professional career development program for all members of the department. And six, develop innovative strategies to recruit, hire, train, and retain a diverse workforce. And seven is expand officer training and wellness. And the last, uh, number eight, is eliminate inefficiencies to reduce costs and increase staffing and police uh, visibility. And each of those have detailed action steps. Um, and I just would like to say thank you for this opportunity. Um, this is, there's, there's many chief positions around the country. And this position here is personal to me. I grew up uh, in Kansas City, Kansas. Um, my um, <clears throat> father died when I was six and my mother when I was 11. So this community really took care of me and gave me the support and the resources I needed to get me through tough times. And I feel that this is my opportunity to give back uh, to the city of Kansas City, Kansas, a city that, that uh, nurtured me and, and a city that I love and one that I always called home. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Right. Our next uh, applicant will be again at 635. So we have a couple of minutes between this and the next.
Okay, welcome back. We now have our fourth and final candidate for the evening, uh, Mr. Rich Austin. And Mr. Austin, what we will be doing is I will be uh, giving commissioners an opportunity to uh, ask questions that they have previously submitted. If there is any additional time at the end, uh, I may be able to uh, offer additional questions provided by the commission. Um, and uh, you would have some time for some closing remarks. <clears throat> But we'd ask uh, at this time if you would uh, just give us an introduction to yourself uh, before we start the commission questions. Sure, thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, my name is Rich Austin. Uh, I currently serve as the Chief of Police of the City of Milton Police Department in the Atlanta metro area. We're about 25 miles north of Atlanta. I've been in that role since January of 2017. Uh, prior to that, I uh, retired from the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department. And for folks that may not be uh, as familiar uh, with that area of the country, uh, Charlotte uh, is a rapidly uh, growing city um, it, uh, right at the border of North and South Carolina. Uh, during that role, um, I worked with an agency of 2,000 officers and several hundred civilian employees to serve uh, almost 1 million uh, residents. Uh, during my time with the Charlotte Mecklenburg uh, Police Department, I worked in a variety of roles, uh, started out in patrol. Uh, I worked in uh, community policing uh, for quite a time. Uh, I worked in traffic. Uh, then as I rose to the ranks, I, I became a patrol officer uh, in the Eastern Division of the city. And uh, from that experience, I um, was selected by the chief of police to, uh, to fill a role in internal affairs as an internal affairs investigative sergeant. I spent five years uh, in that role. Uh, from that point, I was promoted to lieutenant, where I served as an area commander of an area of about 80,000 residents, where I was responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of the officers and detectives in that, that division. Uh, I was promoted to captain. I served as a watch commander uh, in that role, uh, also as an executive officer uh, in both our administrative uh, bureau, where I, I helped the department uh, manage our $212 million budget, and I also worked uh, as an executive officer of the patrol division, which uh, the, uh, the deputy chief's office that I worked out of was responsible for all 13 of our patrol divisions, lakes uh, enforcement, uh, dignitary protection, uh, police permitting, and a few other smaller units within the department. And uh, from that point, I rounded out my career um, as a captain at, of internal affairs, I retired as an internal affairs commander before taking the reins uh, again of the Milton Police Department back in 2017. That's just a very brief flyover uh, of my career. Thank you, sir. Our first question is from Commissioner Kane. Thank you, Mayor. Have you worked with the unions in the past and how did you get along? Uh, I have worked in North Carolina and Georgia and those are both right uh, to work states, so uh, no direct uh, union experience, but something I, I would like to, to say uh, about that is that uh, even though the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department and the Milton Police Department uh, were not required uh, by, by any kind of law uh, or statute to work with the unions, this was something that we, that we did voluntarily. We certainly had a fraternal order of police uh, in Charlotte. I myself was a member, and we wanted to hear from the officers. We wanted uh, to know what their concerns were. The president of the FOP had an open door to the chief's office uh, and we kept that dialogue open and we utilized that feedback to make strategic decisions uh, in the interest of the officers in our community. So uh, though I've not been required to do that, that is something that, that I have always uh, been a part of. The organizations that, that I've been a part of have actively listened to our officers. And I think that's the crux of working uh, with the local FOP is to, is to build those collaborative relationships so that we can look out for the needs of the officers and help them as they serve the community. Thank you. Commissioner Bynum. Thank you, Mayor. Welcome, Chief Austin, and appreciate your interest in serving our community. Can you share with our commission how you've been instrumental in bringing a community-oriented policing philosophy to your department and share an example of a way in which utilizing a community-oriented policing philosophy was critical in solving an issue in your community, please. 
Absolutely. Uh, very much a proponent of community policing. I was actually on a team that helped the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department back in the 90s transition from a traditional policing model into the community policing model for which it's been nationally recognized. And um, within that, one of the first initiatives that uh, I was able to be a part of was called a, a neighborhood action team. And this was a very uh, unique model uh, that, were, that we utilized that actually received some national attention uh, where we uh, deployed two police officers and, and I was a leader of this team and, and one of the two officers. Uh, we were partnered with a uh, fire inspector, a zoning inspector, uh, a um, housing inspector, and a community services specialist. So uh, I was assigned to a very challenged neighborhood uh, just on the outskirts of downtown Charlotte. Uh, the community was very, uh, very much underserved. I had a lot of violent and property crime issues and uh, a multitude of quality of life issues. So we took this multifaceted approach, this pilot team. Uh, we went in and worked. Uh, we first of all dissolved the silos between the internal departments. Uh, we actually worked in the same physical space so that we could work on problem solving together. Uh, from that, we engaged the community to find out what their priorities and their needs were. And then we brought in city services to, uh, to leverage, to, to uh, work on both the quality of life and the crime issues within the community. And this uh, entire process took uh, about a year, a little over a year. And within that first year, we were able to reduce the uh, violent crime in that community by almost 20%, uh, which was something that had, uh, had not happened in that community in recent history, uh, that they had any reductions in crime. Uh, we were able to remove uh, a lot of blight from the neighborhoods through the zoning inspector. We ensured that houses were up to code. Uh, many of them had, had been out of code for, for months and years uh, with no oversight. And we were able to, to bring that housing stock uh, back up. We were able to board up dilapidated houses. Uh, the community services specialist was able to connect people to services in the community, uh, job services, uh, mental health services. Uh, so this collaborative effort, again, helped raise the quality of life very significantly in that community and reduce crime, uh, again, 20% uh, for violent crime. Uh, Thank you. And I mentioned that uh, received some national attention. I just can kind of formalize that a bit. I was twice nominated for a Herman Goldstein uh, Award uh, for Community Policing, and it was also uh, the recipient of a National MetLife uh, LISC Award. Thank you. I really appreciate your information. Thank you. Commissioner Markley. Thank you. Give examples of how you've worked to foster integrity among employees. Uh, certainly, I mentioned my internal affairs uh, experience and internal affairs uh, typically in the police department is the gatekeeper uh, of integrity. Um, so utilizing that experience and my experience as a chief now, uh, I ensure integrity uh, within our department by first of all, setting the expectations of the officers. Uh, we must uh, train officers. And that goes back to the, the folks that we led on the police department to begin with. Our recruiting needs to be um, very robust. Uh, it also needs to include uh, intensive background investigations to ensure that we're hiring people of integrity uh, to begin with. We, we can't really, we, we can train officers expectations, uh, certainly, uh, but if someone is not of, uh, of a nature of integrity, we're not going to be able to change that once they're in the department. We just have to separate from, from that person. So uh, once the person is in the department to set the expectations and to ensure that we have a disciplinary framework uh, that is uh, very efficient and very effective, that addresses uh, proportionally issues of integrity. And I think also we have to be transparent with our community uh, about our efforts to ensure the integrity of the police department. We also have to be transparent when we fall short in those areas as well and let our community know what we're doing to ensure that we have the, uh, the finest police department of the utmost integrity anywhere uh, in the nation. Thank you. Commissioner Philbrook. Thank you, uh, Chief Austin, for uh, coming before us. I appreciate it. Uh, so my next, my question may be a little redundant after listening to your answer, but I'm still going to ask it. And that is, 
how important is CIT slash trauma-informed care training for mm -hmm. officers in the whole police department? Uh, that is a very important uh, aspect, especially now as, as, um, as our nation is going through a mental health crisis. Um, one thing that I have ensured is that our officers within the Milton Police Department are all trained uh, in CIT. And uh, I knew that the value of that program coming in, uh, whenever I was with the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department, we were starting to bring in uh, CIT probably back around 2009, 2010. Uh, I was a lieutenant at the time. And I decided, I was so interested in this training, it sounded intriguing that I actually took the CIT training and became certified myself. Uh, this parlayed into my serving for a time as a, as a CIT instructor. Um, I, I saw the, the, the studies on it. I remember one study uh, with, uh, it was a Memphis Police Department where uh, officer injuries were reduced by 80% after they went through CIT training uh, on whenever they were taking uh, mental health related calls. Uh, it's a safer way for officers to engage. Uh, it's a more humane way for officers to engage. And it keeps the folks that are going through crisis from needlessly entering the criminal justice system. Uh, officers that are trained in CIT, they know uh, what resources are out there and can make appropriate community connections to ensure the person gets the help they need rather than, uh, need, as I said, needlessly entering into the criminal justice system. Very much a proponent that every officer, uh, especially street officers, uh, have that critical CIT training. Uh, there's also a training that is much like that called mental health first aid uh, that can also be very helpful and enhance that training. So, uh, and this is something that we need to continually train on. Uh, and this also spills somewhat into de-escalation uh, as, as well. We need to, to learn how to de-escalate uh, folks that are, that are going through a particular crisis. Uh, I think that that can can be um, just invaluable training for our officers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Commissioner Townsend. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Chief Austin. Thank you for your interest in wanting to serve as Chief of Police here in Kansas City, Kansas. My question to you is this. Many segments of the minority community in Kansas City, Kansas have expressed a growing distrust with the police over the last several years, particularly as a result of several high profile cases for which it appeared minorities suffered unjustly while members of the police department appeared to experience no repercussions for their perceived criminal misdeeds. As chief of police, what steps would you take to build trust between those segments of the community who feel they have been treated unfairly and the police department? I think primarily we have to open the lines of communication to hear uh, what the exact uh, concerns are and ensure uh, that those concerns are addressed. Uh, and as we address those concerns uh, to, to work with the community, to let them know uh, what we were doing. Um, I think having a very strong uh, overall community policing model uh, within the Kansas City, Kansas Police Department will ensure that we are making those vital community connections that we need to make uh, as we are trying to bridge uh, that gap uh, between uh, certain members of the community and the police department. Uh, we have to let folks know uh, without a doubt that we want to engage with their communities and we want to engage fairly uh, with their communities. I'm very much a proponent of procedural justice. I think this is something that we need to train all of our officers on. Uh, tenets of procedural justice, of course, being uh, treating everyone with fairness and respect, uh, giving folks a voice uh, in the process, whether that's on the scene or, or, or longer term, uh, and also working in transparency to ensure that we let citizens know, again, whenever perhaps we fall short, uh, owning those mistakes, and ensuring, again, as I was uh, speaking about in the, in the other uh, question, is ensuring that we have a strong disciplinary framework within the police department, that we've set those expectations, that we ensure our community that we are holding officers accountable uh, when they do fall short. Uh, those are some uh, very effective ways that I found that we can bridge that gap between uh, underserved and, and communities that have distrust of the police um, I found this very effective both in Charlotte-Mecklenburg, and I've also found it very effective 
uh, within the Milton Police Department. I know uh, I got a lot of questions uh, over the summer, obviously with the, with the protest and and that. And even though uh, our our police department has uh, very uh, low use of force and very uh, low uh, co complaints, um, had a lot of folks asking questions. They wanted to know about the policies uh, of the police department. Do we uh, allow chokeholds? Do um, how how we handle mental health calls? Things of that nature. And that led me to, to understand that we could enhance our communication with the, with the community. And something I did was to, uh, to build a, uh, develop a chief's advisory board to make sure that I'm hearing from a wide cross section of our community. Uh, I had a lot of folks that wanted to be involved, but I wasn't hearing from, from all segments of the community. So this chief advisory board has, has been phenomenal. Uh, I have eight members. They represent uh, all geographic areas of our cities. It's very diverse, and I, I uh, help. They help me uh, rather to to vet policies. Uh, they help me to vet initiatives, and they let me know of community concerns. We can can understand what the concerns are uh, before they get to such a high level. That's another way that we can really build uh, trust and legitimacy throughout the community. So those are some ways that I found to help bridge those gaps. Thank you very much. Thank you. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, welcome uh, Chief Dr. Austin. Um, as you have become aware, uh, Wyandotte County is a community that is rich in its diversity. Um, and so therefore cultural competency is a necessary strength that our next uh, Chief of Police must exhibit. With that in mind, what strategies, both short-term and long-term, uh, would you use to increase the diversity of our police force, uh, both in terms of recruitment and in terms of promotion? And please detail any strategies that you have either implemented or witnessed that you view to have been successful. Certainly, uh, cultural competency is, is very important. That's uh, something that we really need to focus on, especially in in the field of law enforcement. Uh, studies show that time and time again, that diverse teams are stronger teams. And we know that best practices are to build a police department that is reflective of the community that it serves. Uh, we need to be placing uh, a lot of resources into how we recruit. We need to be recruiting strategically uh, within the department. Uh, a lot of uh, agencies across the nation now, they want to cast this, this really wide net just to get folks in the door. And I don't think that's the best way uh, to go about strategically recruiting, especially for such a diverse uh, community as Kansas City, Kansas, and Wyandotte County. Um, I'm a proponent of ensuring that everyone in the police department is a recruiter. Now, certainly we need a centralized uh, recruiting function uh, folks that get out to job fairs and, and disseminate information and process applications and, and things of that nature. Um, however, we, we need to train our officers also to be on the lookout for people within our own community that can take the role of, of community police officers uh, and, and uh, folks that they would want to work with shoulder to shoulder, people they know that are of high integrity. Uh, something I've heard uh, time and time again is how proud uh, folks are of this community that have, that have grown up in this community that has been very evident uh, in my visit here. Getting some of those folks that um, from communities that are underrepresented in the police department, uh, the best strategy for that is officers in the field that are out uh, working with those folks every day, serving those folks every day, and helping the recruiting staff identify people. Uh, this could also be done through incentives, uh, which I've uh, found within my career to be very helpful in recruiting efforts. Uh, I remember back in the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department, we offered a monetary incentive if an officer um, located someone who, who was eventually hired. Uh, they were given a part of the incentive, and at the end of the, the officer's first year, uh, they were given the second part of the incentive. Uh, this could be uh, also parlayed into non-monetary, but perhaps days off and things like that. Just some type of incentive to have the officers out looking in the community for people to fill this vital role. And certainly uh, we need officers to answer emergency calls. But, so we also need to have that strategic nationwide recruiting um, as well after we have uh, looked at the community first. Uh, and then 
once we have that that diversity, we also need to uh, to look at how we're leveraging that diversity within the department itself. Uh, again, studies show time and time again, diverse teams are stronger teams. Uh, that's uh, something that uh, ha has been a part of my career. Uh, we need to ensure that the teams within the, the police department uh, are diverse, that we're hearing uh, from a wide variety of, of, of folks. But we also need to ensure that the command staff, that, uh, that folks uh, that are serving our community are also uh, reflective of the community that we're serving. And that also goes to specialized assignments as well. Uh, I think by doing that, we are an overall stronger agency. Um, and a culturally competent agency. Thank you. Commissioner Ramirez. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Chief Austin, for being with us here tonight. Um, my question stems from Commissioner Johnson's, you know, we, as he had stated, you know, we're the second most diverse county in this country. And part of that diversity is our immigration population which provide a lot to our community and who the police department also protects, serves and protects. My question is, what do you believe is a local law enforcement agency's role when it comes to federal immigration law enforcement activities and how will your department respond or interact with said activities? Right, I, I think you had the nail on the head when you said it's the police department's job to serve and protect its community. Uh, I am a very much a proponent of ensuring that our immigrant communities understand that we are a different agency from federal agencies that enforce um, immigration law. Uh, that is a very important first step. Uh, I saw firsthand in the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department whenever uh, the federal government would come in and do these wide sweeps and, and pull families apart and that uh, how much uh, mistrust that bred of law enforcement in general and that not only was, was um, uh, created negative outcomes, but it also created this, this mistrust to the level where we couldn't solve crimes of that very immigrant community that was being victimized, uh, which is um, proving very problematic. We were looking at violent crimes that were going unsolved just because we wouldn't have folks come forward and engage uh, with the local police. And so we had to do a lot of relationship building uh, with our immigrant communities. And that included bringing in uh, folks that, um, that could help us with the language barrier uh, to help folks to understand the difference between local law enforcement and, and uh, federal agencies. Uh, certainly uh, they have their role, but we have to ensure that our immigrant communities understand that we are here to protect and serve their interests, uh, that we are not interested in um, in, in deportation, that is, that is not our role. Our role is, as you said, to serve and protect uh, our entire community. We want to we want to foster trust and legitimacy uh, in those communities uh, as well. So, um, by helping folks to understand that and the different roles can go a long way in building that trust that we need, uh, so that we can most effectively protect and serve those communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chief, I'm going to ask a, a, another one or two questions that were submitted by the commission. Uh, as police chief, what are the major objectives you want to achieve with the police department and with the community it serves? I think the major objective is uh, moving community policing to the next level. Uh, I see a community that, and I've done a lot of research, and uh, on, on the community and where the department is with community policing. And I see an opportunity here to do some very deep um, community policing and problem solving. Uh, one area where I think a lot of departments miss the mark uh, within community policing is it's kind of uh, doing it in a, in a haphazard manner. Uh, it is great to have programs, uh, uh, programs that benefit the community, that build relationships, uh, that build partnerships. But we have to we have to move those partnerships past that and leverage those partnerships for the benefit of the entire community. Uh, so moving the department toward a more problem solving mode uh, to look at the problems that we're having, uh, as we've discussed here today, um, with mental health, uh, the problems that we face in our society. 
with folks experiencing homelessness. Um, real quality of, of life issues. Uh, we need to bring about uh, or, and leverage the programs that we have in a more strategic manner to ensure that we are, are, are actually getting down to the core of the problems that we are facing. The police department is primed to be a catalyst uh, for positive change throughout the community. Uh, we're, we're primed to build partnerships with, uh, with nonprofit organizations, with non-governmental organizations. So I think being strategic ab about that, we will allow the department to drill down on some of these more sustainable problems. Chief Austin, you have two minutes remaining. Okay, and we can start breaking uh, some of the cycles of these very deep-seated uh, problems. So just overall, moving community policing to a more uh, problem-oriented uh, model and ensuring that we're serving the wide cross-section of our community. Thank you. And you have about a minute and a half uh, if you would like to offer any closing remarks, uh, Chief Austin. I would just like to thank uh, this body. Uh, thank you for allowing me to, to come before you and your constituents uh, to, to talk about this very vital role within uh, the Kansas City, Kansas area that's uh, is going to have such a, a wide impact on the future of, of this, this city and this county. And I feel very privileged uh, to be considered uh, for this very vital role. Uh, I love this area. It's, you have a beautiful city. You have been a very gracious host. And I thank you very much for that. I thank you for the opportunity uh, to be here uh, before you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, that concludes our special session. I want to thank all commissioners for participating today. Um, and uh, Mr. Bach, if you would just give us a brief description of the next steps. I know you've already done that. If you would just Kind of call that to mind again. Certainly, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Doug Bach, County Administrator. So our next steps in the process, I, I do have continued interviews that I will be conducting with candidates tomorrow to go through and do some additional one-on-ones uh, to close out the assessment center process. Um, following that, I think I'll, while I've done some extensive background checks, there's still additional work that needs to be done. Um, I do have meetings set up to get additional download from some of the community members that came in today. So I have their full assessment of what came from the Blue Ribbon Committee. And I'll do the same with you all from your assessment of the candidates this evening. So I have a full picture scope of where, what everyone is thinking about this as they move forward to the selection process. Anticipated hiring announcement date of the new chief of police is in May. All right, and thank you all, we are adjourned. Mayor Commissioner Ramirez has his hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. Commissioner Ramirez. Uh, no problem, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just quickly um, pertaining to what Mr. Box said, you know, about how, you know, he's going to speak with us and get our input. Um, I make a request and see if it's possible that, you know, as a body, we have a discussion about these finalists. And I know Council Brown, she said we serve in an advisory capacity. And so I make a request that we meet again as a commission to talk about these candidates and their qualities and what they can provide for our community and possibly provide a unified recommendation, a advisory recommendation to Mr. Bach, because I think it's imperative, especially now during this time of social and racial in injustice, um, I think it's important for the community to see their governing body working together, um, working with administration to find a chief of police that will best fit our community. I would ask that uh, really, this was a really just an opportunity not for us to discuss policy at this point, um, procedure. I think we'd set out the procedures. I would uh, recommend that each individual, Mr. Bach will reach out to each commissioner for their input um, and uh, that we proceed that way as originally planned. The Commissioner Kane. Well, I just wanted to support what, uh, what uh, uh, Commissioner Ramirez said. You know, it, especially with what's going on here in Kansas, Kansas, 
in the last couple of days with the newspaper articles and stuff like that. I think it's important that that we are are more involved than we have been in the past. Thank you. I will take that under advisement. And then uh, if so, we would uh, again convene another special executive session. Thank you. Brett or Carol, you can go ahead and end for everybody. Um, and then that will end the YouTube as well.